Hey, Amir, thank you so much for joining me today and taking out the time for this. Um, there's so much that I want to uncover about so many things in this call. Um, and yeah, get to know about you, your software, and the things that you're doing on LinkedIn. So thank you so much for of taking course. out the time. Of course. Thank you for inviting me in. Um, it's been a long time since we last spoke. Yeah, lots of things change. Excited to chat. Awesome. Uh, well, first of all, let's start with um, getting to know about your experience living in San Francisco now. Um, <laughs> so how have things changed? Yeah, um, I think moving to San Francisco was the biggest move that we did. And um, since we moved here, we like exponentially grow and lots of things happened. We met with lots of people. So we got we closed around, we were closing around seed round and then we got into YC, um, Y Combinator. Now we are not, we like, we are in YC. Uh, we met with lots of cool investors, best in Silicon Valley, lots of customers. Um, yeah, it was, it was the best decision that we made. And yeah, since we moved here, we added lots of team members, advisors. And being in San Francisco helped a lot with that as well. Now I want I am trying to convince our team members to move here. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. Um, if they <laughs> want to, they can. Um, but yeah, it was a good it was a good decision. Sounds good. And was this the initial plan? Like ever since you started the company, did you at one point wanted to move to San Francisco, or was it like just something that happened? No, it was it was always the plan. Um, I still think with like all remote work, all that stuff, um, San Francisco is still the best place to build. So yeah, it was always the plan. It was not easy, but it was always the plan. Right. Okay, so um, let's talk about Hockey Stack. So Hockey Stack is causing a lot of noise these days on B2B social platforms. Mm -hmm. And ma many marketers are seeing it as an attribution tool centered towards dark social, right? So mm -hmm. how did you think of building this platform in the first place? What exactly prompted this idea of this tool? Um, so it's not like, it's not centered only on dark social, but we are making more on dark social and other stuff that are like traditionally not trackable. Um, I would say that. and. So what we are trying to do is we are building the so attribution has been traditionally broken. Oh, everyone has like those horror stories about attribution and lots of people, like oh, every single marketer has a, has an opinion about attribution. Um, if you talk with any marketer, any real ops person, anyone in B2B space, they have an opinion. Um, and most of that has been because of visible, because of those like, old tools um that like used to take weeks even months to set up and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get more data than anyone else in the industry and visualize it in a more like better way in an easier way and so how we are doing that is the work on the client side is five to ten minutes they just copy and paste a couple of scripts it's done they integrate it with their tool if, with their tools it's one click integrations and then done um the ui is no code and you have the option to build any report that you want it's it's like a no code bi tool um and in the recent weeks i have been doing lots of user research and i have seen lots of gaps in the data for example people think podcast is not attributable and this is like lots of refine labs people are talking about this and um it was like it was like not attributable but I, when i did user research with companies that were like doing that are doing podcasts they say that they set up slack notifications with gong and then sometimes they check it out sometimes they don't and the main value of a podcast is brand awareness because no one listens to a podcast and then buy say 50k dollars tool uh, it's like brand awareness you now know Hockey stack, you now know Cognizant, you now know metadata because they, you listen to a podcast. And then over time, if you need that tool, you go to their website, you check out their, their LinkedIn ads and there's another couple of months, maybe weeks, um, but you listen to a podcast. So when you listen to the podcast, doesn't matter. 
And also, when you listen to the podcast, we cannot get that. We probably won't get be able to get that anytime soon. Um, but we can understand if you listen to a podcast or not because you tell that on the sales calls. So we integrated with Khan. Um, so now we can see if the second set they listen to a podcast or not. And then you can see other join other touch points. Mm-hmm. Because usually from the data, we can see even though they say they listen to podcasts, they have been checking out this website, this company for at least like four or five months because the deal is large. Um, and then there are lots of like YouTube ads clicks, um, SEO clicks, I don't know, LinkedIn ads clicks, etc. So we can get that and we can understand if listening to a podcast has a win rate influence. Other things like gifting, we partner with Sendoso. Now we can see if gifting is in value. So what, what I'm trying to convey here is we are trying to get more data and more data than anyone else visualize it in a better way and right now we are building applications on top of it this is a work in progress so imagine you 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 can send this data back to the platforms imagine you can send this data back to your sales team um so you run your revenue in a single place um yeah so that's that's the vision that we're building towards and we call this attribution 2.0 um so yeah yeah, that Something makes that, sense. One last thing. One last thing that we are doing a great job is I think, and last next week I'm um, launching something new about this. So we are getting lots of feedback. And most of the time, if you have an opinion about a tool or if you have an opinion about a, like, for example, if you have an opinion about project management software. So if this was like, if this was like this and then I would use ClickUp more, you cannot, ClickUp would not, probably built that out for you um, but for us for from our customers we get lots of feedback and there have been times we built something in like 10 minutes and then ship that to the customer so next week i'm gonna i've been thinking about this for a long time um how like open source software is a very hot topic and why is like trendy is people can contribute to that piece of software so i am open sourcing the attribution topic for marketers next week with the marketers that I choose, um, the first 10, 15 marketers, I'm going to choose them. And I'm going to bring them together in a community um, so that they can they can let us know what they want us to build. Um, and then from, that, from there, we are going to open source this whole discussion and understand what people need from their attribution tools and reporting. And then we're going to mm-hmm. build the feature of attribution with them. Right. So it looks like the long-term vision is to be able to collect the most data than any other attribution tool and then give like blend everything together and give the whole picture so that people can understand how exactly buyer journeys work. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't like, I don't believe in this whole idea of attribution as giving the whole conversion credit into a single touch point or a team. So sales mm-hmm. set a call, so it's like they're, credit or what we close a one million deal one million dollars deal and then they had a linkedin at such point so linkedin has influences million dollars it's not about that it's more about understanding the customer journey and how we can apply that those learnings into your um strategies so if you get more data data is not your enemy it's like how you're interpreting the data is yeah how, how much value you, you can get from it um so yeah the vision is Attribution attribution is not a, our end product. Um, mm-hmm. It's just the beginning because attribution is like tracking data and then with data, you can build applications and you can do whatever you want with it. Right. So, yeah. Um, that makes sense. So you've been able to grow hockey stack really, really fast, right? Um, but, and at this point, of course, you have a lot of support. You have an incredible team and an incredible set of advisors working with you. But when we, when you were a super early stage company, you didn't have a killer salesperson along with your, um, along your side. You didn't have a talented customer success specialist. Your content wasn't, you know, in the hands of a um, draft driven head of content. How did you and your co-founders found that early success in the, in the company when you didn't have all of these resources? Yeah, um, this is a loaded question. Um, but yeah, we 
first and foremost prioritize LinkedIn over anything else. Um, so me and my co-founder Bura, we posted every day, twice a day. Um, it was like our number one priority. And one thing we did like really, really great job at is um, I see every single, everything, literally everything as a piece of content. So what I mean by that is if you hire someone, so we hired D as our head of revenue a couple months ago. I literally like turned that into a podcast episode, then turned that into a blog post. I like then turned into a couple of LinkedIn posts. Um, like just hiring one person turned into lots of different content pieces. And, and I guess you did the same hired, thing with Obed, right? Yeah, we hired Obed. We recorded a podcast episode the day mm. before we like announced that he joined us. Um, it turned it into a YouTube video. We then we are turned we I think then turned into a blog post and then a couple of LinkedIn posts. And every time we succeed, we fail at something. I turn into a LinkedIn post and then record a video. Um, every single addition to the product, we have a designer now, so we can create high quality videos. We launch every single feature, every single edition as a new like all new feature, even though it's a small integration. We covered, we uncovered the use cases. We then um, create a high quality video, launch it. So the one thing is, if you're like, we are still small. So if you're small, um, and we will be always small compared to other companies. So there's always more money. There's always new funding rounds. There's always more people. So it's always like leveraging your, like it's always about leverage. So what can you leverage to create more content to reach more people? It's about brand awareness. It's about reaching more people. Um, so we always prioritize LinkedIn. And then LinkedIn ads, um, I think starting LinkedIn ads was our biggest milestone because this LinkedIn ads, like LinkedIn ads was our primary growth channel. Um, so with LinkedIn ads, we did a great thing there too. Um, we lost lots of money. We spent lots, we wasted lots of money, but at some point I, like I understood that LinkedIn ads and LinkedIn social is the same platform. It's on the same feed. So I don't need to treat LinkedIn ads any different than LinkedIn social. So then I, I like uploaded lots of things that worked on my LinkedIn profile as creatives and that worked really well. So think of memes, um, think of like right now, for example, we got lots of couple of great advisors, as you also said. Um, and even now, like, I'm running ads on this advisor post. We have a batch like Marco Soglov advisors, like a it's like a batch. Um, and I'm running ads because it's like if you if um if a person is seeing your ads and then if they're not buying or if they're not contacting sales, it can be either they don't trust you, they don't know the product, they know the product, they don't trust you. Or they trust you, but they don't know the product. So we are running product ads. We are running social proof ads. And we are running both of them at the same time. So for social proof, most people think only like G2 ads, testimonials, case studies. But it's more than that. So G2 reviews, everyone knows they're like float. And this is why I like, I'm, it's, I know it's an important channel. But it's why I don't, I have not prioritized that. But I'm going to prioritize it because people, People still believe that, but basically most companies and G2 prioritizes as well. They give $20 gift cards and then they get reviews. If you pay $2,000, you're going to get like lots of reviews on G2. And then if you run ads on that, I know for a fact that these reviews are incentivized reviews. Or like if you run case studies, I know case studies are incentivized case studies as well. So we are trying to do more. Um, so think of advisors, think of people like we literally take screenshots, like lots of people are talking about Akistak. Like, we take screenshots of those and then run ads. Um, I take screenshots of my post on my page, run ads. Um, and then I'm running a, a new campaign in which like our customers talk about why they chose Akistak or competitors, turn into a high quality video, we run ads. Um, so I'm always thinking of like, how can we make people trust us, make people trust the product 
in the category we are in and how can I do more with less? Um, so every day, like I wake up yeah. with my priorities and the biggest priority is always, how can I do all of these things with less budget and less resources? Even though we have more resources every day, I'm trying to reduce it. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, in, unleashes a lot of creativity, right? When you have limited resources, you don't have amazingly big budgets as many other giant companies, then you try to look for creative ways to still get the same amount of yield, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that and also our, our category, you know, you know, um, our category, we had a demo last year. Um, yeah. but our category is interesting because there's not a giant competitor other than mm. like visible. So visible, like no one says, no one uses visible anymore. Um, we don't have a giant competitor. So it's more like if you have, for example, Apollo, um, I love Dan working at Apollo. It's like, they did this with Chili Piper too. Chili Piper was against Calendly and creates a like sense of belonging to the brand because you're like, Calendly is a giant, Chili Piper is the underdog. So you support Chili Piper. With Apollo, Zoom Info is a giant. They're like the enemy. Um, with us, you can't do it because who are we going to do it against Dream Data? They're like 40 people in Denmark, so you say. Um, and uh, factors, they're really small too. Um, so it's more about like creating, a, tr creating trust in this category as well because no one trusts attribution anymore. Um, right. And we are, doing, we are doing like this feature launches is a way to do that as well. Because people see that oh this company is innovating the space so either we join now or we are gonna behind we are gonna be behind of companies that join this brand and use this brand yeah um it's more about that that like feeling mm. so like um in summary it would be explosive content with uh with the objective of building trust in the audience's mind right exactly so mm. companies when, when they say Oh, the Hockey Stack launched podcast attribution. We have a podcast. Our competitor is a podcast. Our competitor, if our competitor uses Hockey Stack and then sees which podcast, like if the revenue influence of their ads and podcasts and everything together, and we don't use it, um, so they're going to be better than mm -hmm. us because they're going to be more efficient. So right. that, like, that, like, here's that the formal thing. Right. Thing. Um, yeah, exactly. Makes sense. Okay, so uh, let's talk about your SEO growth. Um, you've driven great SEO results in a pretty short amount of time for Hockey Stack. Uh, you've generated mm -hmm. about 1 million search impressions, I think, uh, with the content that you published within a time span of six months, I think, right? Um, so what's the secret to fast-paced SEO growth for SaaS companies? Yeah. Um, the the most important thing is focusing on bottom funnel keywords and um and also like being fast like publishing lots of pages in a very short amount of time and then optimizing those later on um so we publish lots of lots of pages and then for those two months just to optimize those um now we have we, have, we didn't any, post anything in the last i think 3 4 months um but we still have the traffic and now we are taking a different approach. We are still optimizing our pages and we are going to start, we are starting now. So we hired Onion, which most people who listen to this podcast, this episode will know, um, Onion from CXL. So Onion, Obed and I, we will be working on content heavily. Um, and then we are taking a different approach. I learned this from Obed. So now we have topics in our mind. We are, we are going to, brainstorm ideas we have lots of topic ideas um but one thing that i learned from Obed is most people approach seo from a keyword perspective so they find the keywords they then they find the topics and then they write it he taught me this you first if you first start with the topic that's like that that's relevant to your brand and relevant to your audience and then you can easily find keywords for that article and then when you launch it say article that's not entirely for seo it's more pe for people but you also have the seo juice um so we are doing that um we're also in a rebrand um we are building our media company so we are launching a netflix style 
page, um, a different brand called The Flow. Uh, we had it, but it's not like it didn't have its own brand, such as it was scrappy. Um, so we're going to do more content for SEO, not for SEO, but SEO optimized content. That's going to help us our new narrative, Attribution 2.0. Um, and our entire goal with this SEO content is going to be um, teaching our audience what we do, plus what good attribution means, and build trust in the category. Um, and for for your question, it's like two pieces. One is publishing fast, and the other one is focusing on bottom funnel keywords, in my opinion, and then optimizing those um, yeah. later on. This is for SEO, but to get the most value out of SEO, I think there needs to be, you need a couple of processes. For example, the best process that we had was um, when we first started doing SEO, my goal was to get people from, we had a free trial back then. Um, so my goal was to, oh, people read this article, they click on this button, and then they start a free trial. So if you look at that funnel, it's like it's zero people do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a live demo. So when I checked out how many people read a blog post and then check out our landing page and then check out our live demo, it's a lot of people. Right. Um, so then I started, yeah, and then live demo is gated. So we get the emails. So then I started putting them into an email sequence and then that worked really well. Um, and then I also started retargeting them. That really worked well. So it's more like, how can we identify the people who read our blog posts and how can we retarget them and how can we send them emails? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, I wonder, um, what do you think of have like having heavily invested into SEO as a growth channel for your company? What do you think of, you know, this demand generation narrative that, um, you know, talks about how SEO is not a growth channel anymore in 2023? Um, so what do you think? Do you think SEO is still a channel to invest in and to think about for SaaS companies? Yeah, um, yeah, if I would start again, I would start with LinkedIn, then start SEO. Um, but I think it's still a growth channel. What people miss is you don't like, everyone sees these channels as a standalone channel. But like if you write a blog article, then you can turn it into a YouTube video, then turn it into a podcast episode, then distribute that on LinkedIn. Um, or any other channel that you're investing in. So it's like a starting point. It's not the end end product. Um, and I still Google lots of stuff. Um, and probably lots of people still Google stuff. And yeah, I still think that it's a growth channel. Um, but in this, like, this age of marketing and dimension and all that stuff, um, even LinkedIn is not a like standalone channel. Um, yeah. So it's more about like having a concrete strategy with like all these pieces. And SEO is one piece that's a really, really big piece because a blog article, as I said, like you can turn it into lots of stuff. Um, but it, I think it has its role. Still, it's still it has a really big role, but it's more about how you can use it um, in a better way. What do you think about this? I mean, I agree. I think, uh, you know, with, with B2B buyer journeys, the idea is that their sales journey overall is pretty long, right? And that means that they need to constantly build trust with the person who they're going to, you know, buy from, um, which of course, you know, like it, it entails so many things that, you know, they're going to discuss it internally and the more stakeholders are involved, the more the touch points would be for them to, you know, get in touch with you. For example, they, exactly the same thing that you guys talked about, right? Uh, they might engage with your website, then they check out your LinkedIn page, uh, engage with you uh, for a couple of months there. And then based on the content and the things that they've been seeing, they might make a decision finally. So in that case, there are multiple channels, right? Uh, that finally played a role in that transaction. Um, and depending on the kind of attribution model that you respect, um, you can say, you can decide what channels do you want to uh, work on in the future. So, yeah. Um, and would you say the same, like, for example, because you are, you know, your customers are B2B SaaS companies. So 
are they of the same narrative that SEO in this, you know, demand generation era, you know, where dark social is a thing and, you know, SEO is not that sexy anymore. Still, we want to invest in it as a, as a growth channel. Um, do you mean like whether our customers want to invest in them? Yeah, but because like they use hockey stack and they can like connect the dots. So what are their insights? Mm -hmm. What have you found? Yeah, um, most of our customers actually want to invest in SEO, but they like we have some great customers and most I think most the smartest marketers now don't see SEO as blog articles. For yeah. example, I have been I have been hearing this a lot. Like everyone wants to do something like Apollo did. They like make they made all of their directory available for everyone and it was mm -hmm. a massive SEO play and was like a really big milestone in their growth journey. Now they're like on their way to IPO and directly just an SEO play um, for people who don't know about it. So if you search for, I don't know, a person and then phone number, Paula, it's on the first page. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then they like connected with a free, free trial or that PLG game. Mm. Um, but it's like an SEO play. So more people are thinking about how we can um, leverage our product and then make it useful for SEO and people so that more people can find out about our products. So yeah, from, that makes this sense. Is what I from our customers. Yeah. Uh, I think it, you know, kind of connects back with the idea of product led SEO that Eli Schwartz and Kevin Indyk talk a lot about, um, which is, you know, yeah. not the stereotypical way of doing SEO, just finding a bunch of keywords and creating content, um, but really just, you know, thinking yeah. of the customers first. Um, and also, if SEO doesn't work, then Google Ads doesn't work too, because they're on the same yeah, page too. Yeah, true, 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 true. Um, I, I think, again, like, you know, going back to the kind of terms that these uh, demand generation folks use a lot, I think for most of the companies, uh, they're not, you know, entering into a totally new category almost always. So there's yeah. always going to be some demand that they can capture. Uh, along with you know building new demand and raising awareness on social channels etc so i don't see seo as a you know standalone channel that would either win or fail i see it as something that can complement overall marketing strategy um, yeah linkedin is the same too Every, everything is the same um okay so talking about linkedin by the way uh, we see that hockey stacks team is really active on like i think pretty much on all of the social media platforms, but specifically LinkedIn, right? Um, so what role do you think, you know, the social content has played in helping you close more deals, drive more pipeline, generating more revenue? Has the idea of social selling worked for you and what's the strategy for it? Yeah, I, I like, I hate the term social selling um, mm -hmm. because it's really, really like most of the terms that we are using right now is they're like the way um for example social selling yeah it's like how you buy from any other i don't know if you go to a supermarket they don't like pitch slap you like, this is the apple that you need stuff like that or if you go to i don't know any other store other than a b2b SaaS, other than the b2b SaaS world no one is pitch slapping you it's like mm. really the way people buy in any other scenario but as it's like really really bad on linkedin people came up with this term. If you like on LinkedIn or any other, like in B2B SaaS, if you do content 1% better, then you're better than 99% 99% of SaaS companies. So for example, Obed just dropped a rap song today. And yeah, it's like, that yeah, is it's pretty like, good. Yeah, it's really good. Um, If you do stuff like this, only like once a month, then you're like better than 99% of other companies. And you don't need to do a rap song you just yeah. need to be a little bit different um yeah so social selling yeah um i can see from our numbers and self-reported attribution and all that stuff so i can basically go to hockey stack and filter by all the companies who have not seen a linkedin net before with our like linkedin net impressions feature so all the companies who have not seen a linkedin net before in any like all time um who have contacted sales and then who booked a demo and then turned into a demo booking, a like qualified pipeline. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I checked this out last month. It was like 60%. Mm. 
at least. Um, and it's like it's increased. It's sometimes it, it sometimes increases, sometimes decreases because we are like introducing other channels into Lumix, and then sometimes they take up some of the percentage, and we get more demos um, every single month. Um, but it's like it's very effective, and I think it's gonna be more effective as we introduce this our new narrative, which is like attribution is not equal to proving our like getting the exact ROI or giving the credit into a team or um, a touch point. As we introduce that and we do that strategically, um, it's gonna increase. Um, but basically, what I did a great job is I found the best people in different things. So I found the best person in the agency world Justin Rowe and I learned from him and I'm not friends with him and then I'm like I found the best person I don't know sales I found the best person in SEO I don't know like best like smartest people in different areas and I made friends with them because I wanted to I didn't see this as like transactional thing um, I didn't want to mm. like I'm going to be friends with this person and I'm going to get thousand dollars in turn in terms of like demos such and not like that but like yeah. this was a natural thing um and then some of them turned into advisors for example jared was like this and my podcast played a really big role because i met with all of these people almost all of these people through my podcast um some of them turned into advisors some of them turned into friends that like help me sometimes be like um brainstorm ideas jump on a call etc and then what this happened is these people as they see our stuff they started talking about us um and this created a buzz and then we introduced influencer marketing into the strategy um which is not a sin this is like this happens on b2c world you, you see kylie jenner posting it was something for a million dollars but if you pay i don't know five hundred dollars and it's like a sin because we're paying them to talk about our product it's not uh we introduced influencer marketing into this mix and then it worked really well too um now we have organic buzz which people talk about us plus the influencer plus mm. so it looks like you see social selling like you, you're talking about the same thing but you you think it's something that just is a part of the human nature when they when they're building relationships and everything and then transactional um, events just happen because you like you, you try to transact from people who you trust yeah so it's more about like being a um, top of mind brand. Mm -hmm. So like when people need an attribution tool, they think of a couple of tools and then um, it, it's like the only thing that matters is being one of those brands or the brand. So if you say attribution, hockey sack, revenue attribution, hockey sack, market attribution, hockey sack, customer journey, hockey sack. So like um, people relate that those terms with your brand. It's like, that's that's what I want, um, and that's what we are. That's that's what we are um, building towards. Yeah. So all of this contribute to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And then last question. I think um. I just wanted to you know expand more on um your narrative around this term that you've coined attribution 2.0. So what exactly is your narrative? Because right now you're building an attribution tool, uh, for the modern era. And you talk about, you know, collecting data from all of the different touch points. But at the same time, there is this idea that no one can crack attribution 100%. Um, so so what, what is your narrative, if I were to ask you? Yeah, so this is like the, the last point is really frustrating because no one, like, for example, we are using Clearbit. And no one says, like, you cannot crack lead identification 100 percent like no no lead identification software is 100 percent i could for example if i work out of a vwork it sees me as trip actions i don't know why but if you go to a vwork then check out your own website you will see yourself as trip actions which is a SaaS company um if i work out of a blue bottle which is a cafe popular in san francisco it sees me yeah. as another SaaS company if i'm home it sees as me is like hockey sack and all yeah. the other, like Zoom Info is the same, Lead Feeder is the same, and other tools are the same. But when it comes to attribution, people have this, like, which is true, but it's true for every single industry. Um, 
so anyways for attribution 2.0 what we think and what we believe and what we build towards is attribution is not about giving the whole conversion credit into a single touch point or a team it's more about understanding customer journey and applying those learnings into the, into your strategies so if you know more about how your customers find out about you um, those journeys and if you have more data and if you know how to interpret it which we gave you in our onboarding um, then you have an advantage against your competitors because you have all the data that we can possibly track as of today. You have a clear way to see how your customers engage with your brand. And you have a clear way to see which touch points, which campaigns, and which channels influence revenue. Um, and it's not signups, it's like actual close for revenue. And you also have brand awareness channels. So if you, if you um, yeah, some some channels are not for conversions. For example, podcasts is not about conversions. Reach campaigns are not for conversions. So we get those brand brand awareness channels and campaigns as well, and then we tie that back to um, revenue. So for example, I was thinking of I was like telling you about how we run meme ads, advisor ads, all that stuff. I know they're not going to influence revenue right away, but but when I like filter by LinkedIn ads impressions. I can see people see those ads for a couple months and then they see a product that, and then they right. see like continue seeing this, that product that, and then they see, oh, this dashboard looks good. And then I know Mark, Mark Kosoglo is an advisor at this company. Jared is an advisor at this company. This company has been on my feet for a long time. So this is dashboard this is cool. I need this dashboard and they, I trust this company. Let me check this website out and then we'll cut it. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so does that mean that the idea of, you know, self-reported attribution makes sense? Um, so yeah. should ideally mm -hmm. companies be using, you know, having a, an attribution software like this, and then at the same time also collect insights from self-attribution because, you know, Chris Walker talks a lot about this, right? Um, and then we have some other kind of marketers. I was listening to this podcast from Rand Fishkin, and he said yeah. he's not a big fan of, uh, self-reported attribution because of the kind of insights that he has seen, like he has been receiving. So like there are, you know, these contradictory views about self-reported attribution and how it fits into, you know, the conversion journey. So what are your mm -hmm. thoughts? Yeah, we do self-reported attribution too. So if you have HubSpot form or if you can launch surveys inside Architect too, um, yeah, you're getting self-reported attribution. I think the, um, it's dangerous if you rely heavily on self-reported attribution, but it's like a really good addition to software-based based attribution because sometimes like all these customer journeys are different and um, as people treat them all equally, that's like really dangerous because sometimes, for example, Justin mentioned us on a podcast two days ago and we got four different demos just from this, that mention. And then none of those companies have seen a LinkedIn ad or visited our website before. So these are all last touch visits from a podcast. And without self-report attribution, we will not be able to get this. But then on the other hand, there are companies like huge companies, public companies that booked a demo. Um, and then if you rely on self report for example, one of them, this is one of the biggest companies in India um, that everyone knows, and they're public. They contacted sales and on the self-report attribution form, he, the person that booked the demo, he said, um, Google. And yeah. like, if I see that and I'm only like, I only like relying on self-report attribution, then what I'm, what am I going to do with this? And yeah. Google, right. Is it Google ads? Is it SEO? Is it like brand ads? Hmm. What is it? And when I check the customer journey, it's not Google. It's like LinkedIn. But like, if you rely on people's perception of how they find out about you, it's like really yeah. flawed. Yeah, it will be distorted. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, we, we, we cannot remember every single step that we took um, towards mm -hmm. the final buying decision, of course. Um, yeah. yeah. And I sometimes see posts on LinkedIn like, oh, I bought this, um, I don't know, espresso machine. And how I, <laughs> let me tell you about how I, uh, made the decision. I went to YouTube and then I looked at a couple videos and then 
I didn't even visit the website. I ordered it on Amazon. If I were the company and I was taking a software-based attribution, I would um, see Google when well, instead it's YouTube. But that coffee machine or espresso machine, whatever it is that you you bought from a YouTube video, it's like five five hundred dollars. Um, for hockey right. sack, it's, it starts at fifteen thousand dollars, and then for a tool like I don't know metadata, it's like sixty k. Mm. Um, for other tools, it's like hundred k. Would you buy a hundred k dollar worth of software from a YouTube video without even checking out the website? No. True, um, true, true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for this, Amir. Uh, it was incredibly fascinating to talk to you. Um, would you say to folks how they can find you? Um, I know that you guys are doing a lot of crazy stuff on LinkedIn, but um, do you want to say something as a closing thoughts where they can find you if they want to connect? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, you could just go um, link on LinkedIn. You can search for my name or Hockey Stack, and then you can connect and like send me a DM, ask me anything. And then um, if you would go to hockeystack.com slash B T H E, the flow, um, and then there's a dash between the and flow, and subscribe to that. That would be awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, looking forward to this episode. Cool. Thank you.